And we ask that you please turn off all cell phones, pagers, or electronic devices. For your own safety, please take a moment to locate the nearest exit. Our usher staff is here to assist you in case of an emergency. To learn more about upcoming performances and events, please visit performingarts.nd.edu. Thank you for joining us. Very warmest welcome to everyone. It's great to see such a, a big crowd here. Uh, this is an exciting night at Notre Dame. We're, tonight we're inaugurating a, really a year, more than a year, of serious discussion about one of our nation's most pressing and urgent problems, the reform and enhancement of K through 12 education. As you know, that will be the subject of the 2011-12 forum, and tonight anticipates that, and uh, we are just uh, tremendously excited. I know you've seen Waiting for Superman, which in a, in a, in a very powerful way reveals the challenges uh, K through, of K-12 through education in this country uh, with the symptoms of dropout rates, of poor performance on tests. Uh, we've called this event tonight the system. And that's an appropriate title because the problems are systematic and they're deep. And addressing them will require imaginative and energetic and profound solutions. And I hope this night with this very distinguished panel will inaugurate a year of a very serious thought and discussion among all of us about how to address these issues. It's a tremendous privilege for us to have uh, such a distinguished panel. Uh, I, Nicole will introduce them, so I will not go into their um, details, but they're a very distinguished group, uh, among the most distinguished people in this area, in our nation, and, and we're just so pleased to have them here at Notre Dame. I'm going to just uh, begin, before I introduce uh, our MC tonight, with, with a little prayer as we begin this serious discussion, this serious thought. Let's, let's just bow our heads in prayer. Lord God, you've given us minds to understand the world and to make it better. You've created a world in which we pursue truth and thereby pursue you. And education is so critical to our lives together and to living a full human life. And so we ask your special blessing on our deliberations tonight and in coming months and the coming year to think creatively and deeply and imaginatively about the issues of K-12 education in this country so that we can improve this system and give young men and women in this country greater opportunities to learn and achieve all that you meant them to be. And we pray this all through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. It is now my great pleasure to introduce our moderator for this evening. Nicole Garnett is a professor of law at the Notre Dame Law School and a fellow of Notre Dame's Institute for Educational Initiatives. A graduate of Stanford and of Yale Law School, she is widely published in the areas of land use, local government, and education reform. Please welcome me in joining a distinguished professor here at Notre Dame, Professor Nicole Garnett. Nicole. Um, thank you, Father Jenkins. It's a great honor to be here today to moderate this discussion of something that I think we can all agree is at really one of the most pressing civil rights issues of our day, and that is the failure of our elementary and secondary schools to educate the children who need them most. It's also an issue that cuts to the heart of our mission here at Notre Dame because everything we do at Notre Dame is animated by a belief that all children are formed in the image and likeness of a loving God and that we're called first to serve the least among us. So it's a great pleasure to be here. I want to thank everybody who's here on behalf of my faculty colleagues at Notre Dame, especially at the Institute for Educational Initiatives, especially students and members of the greater South Bend community. We hope this is one of the, just really the beginning of a conversation 
that will follow, follow next year and hopefully forever about this important issue. Um, we couldn't have a better group of people to kick off this conversation, so it's a privilege for me to be able to introduce each of them to you and then to turn the floor over to them to discuss this uh, critical issue of uh, the future of our K-12 schools. Um, first, uh, Michelle Ree is the founder and CEO of Students First, which is dedicated to defending the rights of children by pursuing transformative education reform. In 1997, she helped found the New Teacher Project, uh, which helps education leaders develop and train and retain the best teachers in our schools. Um, and since its inception, the New Teacher Project has recruited and trained 45,000 teachers. Uh, in 2007, she was appointed chancellor of the DC Public Schools, where she oversaw an aggressive reform, which led to remarkable uh, student achievement uh, improvements. Howard Fuller is the distinguished professor of education and director of the Institute for Transformation of Learning at Marquette University. From 1991 to 1995, he served as superintendent of the Milwaukee Public Schools, where he very courageously was a primary champion and principal architect of the Milwaukee Parental Choice Program, the nation's first private school choice program, which today provides more than 20,000 opportunities for children to attend high quality private schools in the city of Milwaukee. He's also the founder of the Black Alliance for Educational Options. Sarah Martinez Tucker is the former uh, CEO and president of the Hispanic Scholarship Fund. During her time at the Hispanic Scholarship Fund, she generated funds for uh, 39,000 Latino men and women to attend college. From 2006 to 2008, she served as Undersecretary of Education in the United States Department of Education, where she oversaw all policies and programs related to post-secondary education. Um, and Sarah is also a trustee here at Notre Dame, and it is always a delight for us to welcome her home. Uh, finally, John DiIulio is the Frederick Fox Leadership Professor of Politics, Religion, and Civil Society at the University of Pennsylvania. He uh, is the author of over a dozen books and hundreds of articles on American politics and public policy. He was the inaugural director of the White House Office of Faith-Based and Community Initiatives and also helped President Obama's transition team retool their own faith-based initiatives uh, most recently. Um, so I hope that we can all join me, me in welcoming all of our panelists to Notre Dame. Uh, so my job is, is really just to uh, turn it over to the panelists here to ask a few key questions um, and engage them in this most important issue that we have before us uh, in our nation today. Um, I'm going to ask only one thing of my panelists, which is to uh, answer with wholeheartedly and briefly so that we can all um, learn from one another and also have a chance for the people in the audience, especially our students, to give us our, their own thoughts about this. So the first question uh, cuts to the heart of the issue, and um, that is really just what is, I'll start with uh, Michelle and move across the line. If each of you want to say what you think, what is, what's going right today with American elementary and secondary education? What's going wrong? We hear a lot about what's going wrong. Um, what do we, what can we do uh, to tip the scales in favor of success, especially for our most disadvantaged students? So we could probably talk for a really long time about uh, these two questions. I'd say what's going right. Um, one is that we have, we're, we're, we're at a specific moment in time right now that uh, at least in my 20 years of doing education reform work, I have not seen before. There's more attention being paid to public education reform and we, we have the opportunity now, I think an opening now to either radically transform it. If we can't take advantage of this opportunity, then I, I don't know that another one like this is, is ever going to come up. Um, so that, I think, is something that we have going for us right now. Uh, I think we've got uh, hundreds of thousands of incredibly hardworking uh, teachers out there, many of whom are doing absolutely heroic things in inner city classrooms uh, across the country. Uh, we finally now have uh, some uh, schools, and a lot of them are charter schools, who have sort of broken through this myth that uh, low-income minority kids can't learn at the highest levels uh, because they have managed to do this through pro programs like KIPP, 
uh, like Achievement First, like Aspire across the country. There's, these are charter school management organizations that have, at scale, been able to show that if you take poor and minority kids and you put them in the right environment, they absolutely can not only surpass uh, their peers, but, but surpass their white counterparts, uh, white affluent counterparts in terms of their academic achievement levels. So we finally have a lot of these proof points of what works and the fact that we, we can no longer sort of take these excuses uh, for low academic achievement levels. Um, and I think last is, is the kids, uh, is what we have going for us. You, I mean, this is, kids are what drive me every single day, and it's what I miss most about my job in D.C., because you could never go into a school anywhere in Washington, D.C., choose any child out of the hallway and spend, you know, more than 10 minutes with them and not absolutely believe in your core that that child could achieve whatever uh, they wanted to as long as we as the adults in the system were creating the right environment and the right expectations for them. So the kids absolutely, I think, are the thing that we have going for us uh, that, that's the most powerful. Um, what is going wrong in education is probably everything else. Um, <laughs> And that is not an understatement. We have a, a culture in public education that is absolutely focused on the wrong things. I mean, I can just give you a few examples of this. We, over the last three decades, have more than doubled the amount of money that we're spending per pupil on public education. And the results have, at best, stayed the same and on many measures have gotten a lot worse. And uh, the common theme that you'll hear uh, people say about how we're going to fix public education is we need more money to do it, when in fact the data shows that more money does not equal better results. Uh, I think we've got a, a system where uh, you have basically over the last three decades the education agenda in our country has been driven by special interests. Uh, you've got you know, textbook manufacturers, you've got teachers unions, you've got texting companies, and, and the problem in, the, in that dynamic is that you, you, you don't have a national organized interest group with the same heft as the teachers union that's advocating solely on behalf of children. So when you've got a very powerful interest group who's sort of lobbying out there, you know, the teachers unions have millions of dollars and millions of people, and they use those dollars and those people to get the politicians that they want elected and the laws that they don't want, you know, the laws they want passed and the laws that they don't want blocked. And if there is not an, an equal or greater force at the table that's saying, what is, what is in the best interest of children, then you're going to end up with a landscape of laws and policies that is skewed. Towards, towards one group, and that group is not children. So, uh, you know, we, we, we've, we've got that situation. We have a system essentially where there is zero accountability uh, for the results that we're delivering for kids every day. When I was uh, the chancellor in the DC school system, one of the most astounding facts uh, that nobody seemed to, to really question a lot was the fact that when I got there in 2007, 8% of the eighth graders in the city schools were on grade level in mathematics, 8%, which means that 92% of our young people did not have the skills and knowledge necessary to be productive members of society. But when I looked at the performance evaluations of the adults in the system at the same time, it showed that 95% of them were being rated as doing an excellent job. <laughs> How can you have a system where all of the adults are running around thinking, we're doing great work, and what they were producing for kids was 8% success. So when you have a system that is so out of whack and so sort of misguided, then it's actually no surprise whatsoever that we have seen the dismal outcomes that we have. Howard? You know, I think what is right is that, at least at the level of rhetoric, uh, this country is on record saying that all children can learn. And believe it or not, for your generation, that sounds like, well, of course. But you need to understand that that's almost a revolutionary change from how it once was in this country. So just that notion is something that is right. What is wrong is that we do not have the political will in this country to make good on that alleged belief. 
And so if you think about what's wrong, I want you to think about it in this way. On February 1st, 1960, four students from North Carolina A&T University, young people your age, sat down at a lunch counter in Greensboro and demanded to be served. And we're now in a situation where four young black Americans would sit down at a lunch counter where they're welcome and can't read the menu. I'm done. <laughs> I, um, I, I just, I have to start my comments by, uh, John Schoenig mentioned last night how quickly this event sold out and that the majority of the audience was gonna be students. And I, many of you who know me know that I bleed burn orange. But the reason I dedicate my time to Notre Dame is the quality of the undergraduate students here. And that so many of you took your Wednesday night to be here with us tonight just gives me hope for the future that many of you, this many of you care about reforming K through 12 education. So just thank you to the students that are here tonight. Those of you that I've had the chance to meet with um, through my association with Notre Dame know that I'm, I'm not a K through 12 expert. I've spent the last 15 years of my life trying to honor my parents by paving the way to college for disadvantaged students or by making sure that the United States of America has enough college graduates to keep us globally competitive. And so I look at it from the higher ed side to say, are we producing what we need to out of K through 12? And, and I would echo what Michelle said, and I would echo what Howard said about what's right. I would add to it that over the years, we're producing more college graduates, we're succeeding with more disadvantaged students, we're creating more pathways to non-traditional college um, degrees, certifications for students. So we're doing more with greater numbers and with greater disadvantaged non-traditional students. At the end, though, there are two things that concern me and, and, and what is wrong with, with our system in the United States. One is we're not producing enough. And two, I don't like the conversation that's being held nationally that would, in essence, foment breakthrough thinking. So let me break both of those down a little bit on the we're not producing enough. Years ago, it, 2012 seemed really far away to me. It's next year. The National Association of Manufacturers says that by next year, 40% of factory floor jobs are gonna require some form of post-secondary education. Today, half, over half of the 17-year-olds don't have the skills for factory floor jobs. So now we look at where are the fast-growing jobs, where are the new jobs? 60% of the new jobs require a bachelor's degree. 90% of the fastest-growing jobs require a bachelor's degree. This is all in 2012. So what happened in 2007? the year that we would have produced, in essence, the students that were going to get their college education and be ready for 2012. 2012, we're going to be 3 million college graduates short of filling jobs. In my time in the administration, and even now, you know, CEOs are coming up and saying, we need more, you know, the visas. We've got to get more foreign students in here to be able to get jobs after they get their education. And I'm sitting back there thinking, what about kids in the United States of America? Why aren't you outraged about what's happening here? Certainly there are social and cultural issues that have to be addressed. Certainly, if we look at 2007, we've got to look at the kids that were academically qualified for college, but couldn't get to because they couldn't afford it. In, in 2007, 250,000 students graduated from high school, fully academically prepared for college, and didn't have the finances to start. But in 2007, we also had one million students drop out of high school without a high school credential, the base that you need to start college. We also had a million kids that took indicated college-bound interest, but yet when they took their tests, they were not ready for college-level math, college-level English. Two-thirds of the kids that took the ACT that year were not ready for college-level math, and one-third were not ready for college-level English. We're not producing enough. So you sit back and you say, all right, what's the conversation that's being held across the spectrum of education all the way through to employment to say, are we at least having the conversations about how to fix the fact that we're not producing enough graduates here in the United States of America. When I spent time during our Commission on the Future of Higher Education, all the corporate people on the board complained, on the commission, complained that the quality of the, high school, of the college graduates they were getting needed additional education before they could be fully productive in corporate America. So then you go to the college 
administrators and you say, what's happening here? And they said, well, you know, you should see the quality of the high school students we're getting. So then you meet with principals, and the principals say, well, you should look at the quality of the middle school students we're getting. <laughs> then you go to the middle schools, and they say, well, you should look at the quality of the elementary schools we're getting. Then you get to the elementary schools, and so on. And you sit back and you say, okay, the blame game. Where are we going to stop the blame game? When is somebody going to take ownership and say, we've got to stop that, look at the quality of my inputs, you can't hold me accountable for the quality of my outputs. Corporate tried, or at least they say they did, but after maybe a year at it, they just basically outsourced the jobs that they could for technical competence, and they kept in the United States the jobs where it was the value-added strategic thinking that paid the premium for American higher education. I think that post-secondary institutions need to take the lead in changing the conversation that's being held in K through 12 reform, and I'm excited that tonight maybe gives us the opportunity to think about what is the role of a post-secondary um, institution? What is the role of an institution like Notre Dame that produces so many undergraduate students who care enough to be here tonight? And what is it that we can do to change the conversation that's being held about what's wrong in, post -second, in, in K through 12 education? Thanks. Wow, uh, my colleagues have covered the waterfront, uh, but, uh, but I'm a professor, so I have to talk. Uh, and I can, I can speak for five minutes or two hours on any subject with no essential change in content. Um, so it's, it's, a professor. it's what professors do. It's what professors do. Um, so uh, let me, let me, there are a couple of things. I mean, uh, amen to all of the above. And let me just pick a couple of things very quickly. Um, one thing that is very wrong, and I'm speaking here mainly about urban public schools that serve predominantly low-income and minority children and youth. That's very wrong, and that still does not get enough attention, is school violence. Uh, it's a national problem. It persists. It's underreported, or not reported at all in many jurisdictions, frankly. I would encourage uh, you, I know you all have these things called computers, I've heard about them, I'm not myself <laughs> on the internet, uh, but uh, the Philadelphia Inquirer newspaper ran a seven part, seven day series last week just looking at that school violence problem in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And for years the school district had been saying, oh, school violence isn't a problem or it's going down. Well, uh, the series is heart heartbreaking, but it showed that just last year in Philadelphia there were 4,500 plus violent incidents, and violent as in uh, robberies, sexual assaults, and beatings of students, and of, of teachers, and of school staff. Um, the, the problem is pervasive. Uh, the Inquirer's editorial at the end of the series said there is a pervasive culture of violence in the schools. Obviously, nothing, good, nothing much good can happen in that context. Uh, a safe environment where you feel secure is a necessary, if insufficient, condition for all the other good things to equip and empower children to learn. So that problem just, it's, it's a very ugly problem, but it's real. I think it's implicated with a second thing that's very wrong, and that is, and it's sort of been touched upon, but I'll say a word or two, the school dropout crisis. Um, in, in 2006, I, did, I co authored a report uh, called The Silent Epidemic, and um, it, it kind of got more attention than I expected. It, got, uh, it triggered a cover of Time magazine. Even more exalted, it got three days of Oprah. <laughs> uh, uh, and, you know, but it's five years later, and frankly, the, the over-reporting of graduation rates continues. In March in Pennsylvania, and I'm a hometown guy, so I'm talking a lot about my hometown here, but Pennsylvania, the Department of Education issued its new way of calculating graduation rates. And by the new method, which is more accurate method, the Philadelphia school district, public school district graduation rate went from over 70% down to about 55%, okay? And that's probably still, many of us think, inflated. Um, when you have African-American children, African-American males in Philadelphia who begin ninth grade and have barely a 50% graduation rate after six years, not four, something is desperately wrong. Uh, what's right is what you've just, much of what you've just heard. The fact that you're here, the fact that these issues, thanks to those individuals on this panel, frankly, here to my left in no small measure, are back on the public agenda, a moment for discourse and discussion about these issues that, frankly, I haven't seen in my adult lifetime, and so the hope uh, that we can make some real progress. Okay, uh, the, the second question that I have, and I think I'll for, turn first to Michelle and John, um, is about teachers. 
I think that it is uh, true that I think one of the great things that's going right is that we believe that kids can learn. And we also know that what they need to learn is good teachers. In fact, that's what they most need to learn is a good teacher, and hopefully one more than one year in a row. So I wondered if what your thoughts were about how um, we can, how should we think about recruiting and training, identifying the very best talent for our classrooms, and how do we know when our teachers are succeeding? All right, Michelle, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle might have thought about this before. You know, I don't think there's a, a lot I can say on, on sort of the, the teacher recruitment selection professional development front that hasn't been said before, quite frankly, and that is um, different from what is, is true in any sector across uh, the, 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 the um, scoreboard. So, you, you know, I, I, I think that you've got to recruit the best talents. You have to invest in them. You, you don't have to select people appropriately. Um, you have to recognize and reward the best. You have to really quickly um, improve or, or, or move out the, the ineffective folks. So that, you know, to me is the obvious stuff. I think the problem that we face right now in terms of talking about teacher quality in America today is that if you start to want to differentiate amongst teachers, and, and you have to do this, I mean, there, for a very long time there was this belief that all teachers were created equal, that they were interchangeable widgets, that you could take one out and put another one in and it wouldn't make any difference. And the data shows exactly the opposite, that, that there is a huge difference in the quality of teachers and that if a child has three highly effective teachers in a row versus three ineffective teachers in a row, it can literally change their life trajectory. Uh, but um, there is this real uh, aversion right now to wanting to differentiate amongst teachers. We want, we want, we want to feel like all teachers are, are great. And, um, and so if you start to want to differentiate or you start to want to, you know, to question some of the policies that are sort of dictating how our teachers uh, get, get placed in schools and you're labeled as you know, anti-teacher and a union buster, trust me, I know this, I've lived it firsthand. <laughs> um, but, and it's, and it's, a, it's a very problematic dynamic. And let me just tell a quick anecdote. So I was, my, my fiance is a, is a mayor of Sacramento. He's a formal, former NBA uh, player, so he played in the league. And, I was trying to explain this dynamic to him, and he was like, I, I don't understand what you're saying, Michelle. And I said, okay, let me, let me put it to you in terms that you can understand. I said, say when I resigned as the chancellor of the DC schools, I decided that as my next career, I was going to be a professional basketball player. So I you know, practice, I do everything, I, I go out, I, I, you know, my first game in the league, and I stink it up, right? <laughs> And I come back off the court at the end of the game, and the coach says, you're done, you're fired, you're terrible. Uh, then I would say, this is not fair. So I'd go to the owners and say, you know, I, I, I practice every night. I, I shoot 100 free throws. I do everything that I'm supposed to do. You, you can't fire me. And the owners would look at me and say, our livelihood is based on people wanting to come to the games. No one would want to come to watch you play. Um, and, and this is, you know, how we make our decisions. So we have, you know, no use for you here. Uh, then I maybe would go to the Players Association, right, and say, I'm a player. You're players. Help a player out, right? You got you to gotta, you gotta defend me. And they would look at me and say, we, it, it's not good for the profession to actually have players as bad as you in the league. It doesn't make us look good, so you gotta go. And then I, I you know, said to Kevin, well, and then maybe at, you know, as a last stop, I would come to you, honey, and I would say, baby, help me out. And you would probably look at me and say, honey, I love you, but you suck at basketball. <laughs> No offense, but let's find a career for you that you're really going to add value to, where you can be good. That, all of that that would be happening, that's not anti-player. That's anti-Michelle being a player, right? And so that's what we have to, we have to be able to create a dynamic with teachers where when we start to talk about effectiveness, that it doesn't become an anti-teacher thing. It's just knowing that this is the most difficult job you could possibly have. I'm telling you that being a teacher, and in particular being a teacher in an urban school district, is the most difficult thing that you can do. And because of its difficulty, 
not everybody is going to be good at it. And, and we should be okay with knowing that because it's such an important job where the consequences are so great, if, you're, if, if you are not effective, that we have to be okay saying, you know what, some people are going to make it in this position, in, in this place, some people aren't. It's no, it doesn't mean you're a bad person. It just means that you, you cannot have the privilege of teaching our children. I'm just sitting here trying. Okay. No, uh, we're going to hold questions uh, till the end of. Uh, we'll have an opportunity for everyone to ask questions. Thanks. Thank you. I'm just sitting here trying to ponder which of us, with your physique or mine, is less likely to make it to the NBA. <laughs> um, <laughs> In my case, it's obviously that I'm not tall enough. Uh, uh, two things, right? Uh, I co-author, I'm happy to say, I'm the junior co-author, been for 20 plus years, uh, a leading American government textbook, one of the most, the most widely used, I'm, I'm told, in the AP market, and used at uh, lots of colleges and universities. I'm not qualified to teach AP civics in my public school district. They can use my textbook, but I'm not qualified to teach in that district. A uh, Nobel Prize winning physicist isn't qualified to teach, doesn't have the right certification. I just think something's fundamentally wrong with that. So when we talk about recruitment and identifying the best people, whether in terms of substantive knowledge or whatnot, I think that's a bit of a problem. But putting that aside, let me just say one, very, one thing very quickly, I'll sort of go to the, what I think is the core of it. I've been teaching for 30 years, all colleges, although I did spend a couple years as a volunteer teacher at a couple of uh, inner city schools and Catholic schools. And I'm convinced of one thing, that teaching is not a profession, it is a vocation. It is a vocation. It requires a sense of mission. It requires a transcendent sense of purpose, as ethereal as that might sound. And so to create a system that bureaucratizes, in any, to any degree, the profession of teaching, in which it, be, in, in, in which it becomes rule-bound, and in which you know, we have to talk about pay for performance systems, which I support, but which are really symptomatic of the problem, which is that teaching, uh, I don't care whether it's at the pre-K level or at the university level, that is not approached as a vocation by people who feel it and experience it as a vocation, does not go well. Lord, Michelle, do you? Um, so the next question I'd like to first direct to Howard and then ask Sarah to jump in, and that's about the achievement gap. We all understand and know what the achievement gap is. You've already, we've already talked about the achievement gap, particularly in, for urban minority students. Um, we know that it's a problem, and we know that it is real and unacceptable. We know we have to address it. Uh, and we also now have gotten to the point where we understand that everyone can learn, regardless of their life circumstance. But how do we go about addressing this achievement gap? And where, if anywhere, is it actually being successfully addressed? You know, first of all, I, I, I'm not sure that we do know. I, I, I mean, I think we, we have sort of an intellectual sort of grasp of it. But in terms of how it really affects real kids, like every day, a lot of us have absolutely no idea. And so, like, I chaired a board of a small high school. And last year, we had three ninth graders reading on a pre-K primer level. And we had 60 kids who were in our 9th through 12th grade reading at less than a 6th grade level. And so what that means is that if you come out and you're a, a social studies teacher and you get eight kids in your class who can't read, you're not, you, you, you have no idea how to, quote, teach them social studies or language arts. And so this achievement gap that we're talking about is so horrendous that I think a lot of our uh, elected officials and so forth really can't make the step to understand how devastating this is. And it, 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 it's, it's an achievement gap that isn't just a gap between black kids and white kids and Latino kids and white kids in the United States. There's the achievement gap between the kids in this country who think that they are wonderful and the rest of the world. Because when you begin to look at the OECD data and you begin to understand uh, like where we are in the rest of the world and our, our, our best kids, our best students are behind other students nationally. And then you try to say, if that's true, what chance then 
do the kids have in the urban area who can't read, write, think, analyze, or compute? And if you read Tom Friedman's book, The World is Flat, and that doesn't scare you, then someone needs to check you for pulse. Because, <laughs> because literally, this is the scariest stuff. That, or, or if you look at a, a, a video like Two Million Minutes, which looks at two uh, students from China and I think two students from India, and then looks at two white students from supposedly one of the best schools in America. And you see the difference in terms of the intensity level, the amount of time that these other students around the world are, 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 are given to their education, we've all got to wake up and understand that we have a deep problem here. And it's not just a problem that's a problem in the inner cities. It, 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 it is a problem in America. And, 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 and so my hope is that young people like you are not going to buy the hype. Because the interesting thing about young people in America, we lead the rest of the world in self-confidence. <laughs> we, we don't lead the rest of the world in anything else other than that. I mean, but we're, we're, we're clear that we're smart, even though everybody else is saying we're stupid. I mean, you know, like that John Stossel uh, uh, TV program a few years ago, Stupid in America? <laughs> when this kid from Belgium looked into the screen and said, American kids are stupid? I mean, so, I, I mean, I'm, I'm deeply concerned about the fact that we're intellectualizing about this achievement gap and not really understanding the depth of it and the implications of it. And so what I, what, what, I would leave you with this. One of the interesting things is, um, and I got this from uh, Friedman's book too, but you know, a, a, a lot of politicians, particularly white politicians who, who find their way to the black community, you know, they, 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 they've learned to say, oh, it takes a whole village to educate a child. And most of these people couldn't find village with MapQuest. They don't even know, you know, like, you know, where this is. And they, they show up, oh, it takes a whole village to educate a child. Well, you know, first of all, I hope that plays out soon, because I'm tired of that. But. Uh, but, 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 but Friedman had this uh, parable that I would like you to think about. And what he said was, every day in Africa, a gazelle gets up. And the gazelle knows that if it can't run faster than the fastest lion, it's going to get killed. A lion gets up knowing that if it can't run faster than the slowest gazelle, it's going to starve. Either way, when the sun comes up, they both start running. And what's happening is, Young people from all over the world are getting up every day and they're running. And they're running faster than we are. And then we have young people who, who, who are so far behind that they're not even in the game. And these young people are not going to fall off the earth. Where they're going to be is they're going to show up in these other public institutions called prisons. And if we don't begin to really truly understand this, that, 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 and, and, and I'm pleased that you all are here and, 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 and I'm honored by your presence, but you all have got to take this to another level. We cannot intellectualize this achievement gap for another generation. It's not acceptable. And somewhere along the line, you all have got to demand more from those of us who for years have verbalized about this problem. But when it comes time to make real hard decisions that would change the power relationships in this country, we're not trying to hear that. And whether it's dealing with union policies, whatever it is, it's clear to me that adult interests far outweigh student interests. And as long as we allow adult interests to dominate, we will never close the achievement gap in this country. And I think that people like Thurgood Marshall, they must be turning over in their graves to think that 50 some years after Brown, we'd be talking about an achievement gap in America. It's a moral, outrage. 
And what outrages me is that more of us are not outraged. I think it is important to look at the human dimension of it. And um, as it turns out, last week I was in my home state and I, and I did uh, 15 focus groups with Hispanic and African American students who overcame low SATs to get into a selective college and major in the STEM fields. And I was curious as to how they made it so that we could see if we could replicate their journeys. And so I want to talk a little bit about what Howard said was so important, which is, in their eyes, you know, how do they see the situation? And maybe to the Michelle's point a, a while ago, when I asked the kids, how prepared were you for college-level work? With a very few exceptions, they weren't ready. And these were students that were in the top 10% of their classes. And yet, so they think they're a big man on campus, a big gal on campus, and they come to UT, and they're failing and they're scared to death because they've never failed at anything before. And so they acknowledge that they're not prepared for college level work. But when I then turned around and asked them, but why are you here? It was a teacher that took an interest in them that got them excited about this field. And I asked them, how is it that the teachers that you hold in such high regard as the reason you're here didn't prepare you for the education that you're here? And it was the deer in the headlights look. And I, and I started remembering anecdotally conversations I've had with teachers across the United States, particularly teachers who, had, who were in school districts where the demographics had changed dramatically in recent years. And I had teachers say to me, I don't know why you're in here riling them up about college. My job is to make sure that they have enough English and reading skills to vote and enough math skills to balance their checkbook and get them ready for the poultry processing plant, get them ready for the carpet mills. And you being in here and setting false expectations does education no good. I remember hearing from teachers, my job is to get this select group of students into college and the rest of them, I'm managing them like discipline. When students today rely on the teacher to give them that sense of worth into what's possible for me, and so many teachers are already deciding they don't need college, they don't merit college, I worry about what they're doing to their own confidence of their students. I worry about what they're doing to young teachers who come in and have that belief that we do in Catholic education, that every student is worthy of an education. So I, I share your outrage, Howard, because I, I worry that we've got such young minds that we're not encouraging. Um, Howard mentioned the OECD data, and, and as an American, this is what scares me. We still lead the world in the percentage of 55 to 64-year-olds who have a college degree. But if we look at the 25 to 34 year olds, just in my time um, in the Department of Education, we went from seventh to eighth to 10th to 11th. This is the first time in our country's history where we have a generation of kids that's less educated than the generation before them. And, and, and I look back behind that and I say, what's happening? If, if you're 17 years old, 10 years from now, 10 years from now, that's a long time to get a college degree. Only 17% of 17-year-olds will have a college degree. When you disaggregate the data and look at the race ethnic categories, it's much worse. And what scares me is if you look at 24-year-olds in this country, 75% of the upper income kids will have, got a co would have, will have received a, a college degree. Less than 10%, less than 10%, 9.1% of low income kids will have by age 24 had a chance at a college education. And the root cause for that is fairly straightforward. Less than 10% of low-income kids have access to a rigorous curriculum in high school. These kids don't know it. And do you know how frustrating it is to be meeting with students, high school seniors, and talking about college, and they tell you that their four years of math are introduction to algebra, algebra, introduction to geometry, and geometry. They've got to go to a community college and spend two years getting the requisite math courses to be competitive for a four-year college. What are we doing to children in this, in this country when you buy into the American dream, you buy into public education, parents don't know what it is that they need to demand of their local schools, and students end up getting their high school, not diploma, but their high school certificate, and they're not ready for college level work. We're, we're dashing, and, and when you spend time with the kids, the kids know it. The kids can see in their teacher's eyes when the, kids, when the teacher doesn't believe in them. 
The kids can see who the counselors think need to go to college. And if we believe that everybody has the, the right to learn, if we believe that everybody has the right to the education that they deserve, why is it that we have so many people getting between the confidence of our young kids and, and what needs to happen? We're not going to solve the achievement gap if we continue to take away the confidence of all our children that need people to believe in them more. Thank you. Um, next question, I'm going to start with Michelle and then maybe turn into Howard. It, it's about um, the role of school choice in all that we've been talking about. So there's a lot of talk now about the need for quality educational options um, for especially in urban areas, but I appreciate, Howard, your point about how I think a lot of Americans think their schools are better than they are. Um, but despite that, there's still school choice, charter schools, school vouchers, tax credits remain intensely controversial. So I wonder um, what, role we th what role you think, from your experience, um, school choice plays in um, addressing the problems that we are, are talking about, and what have we learned so far from the, the school choice and the charter, charter school movements? So I think that choice plays a huge role in our ability to move aggressive school reform in this country. I can tell you firsthand from when I, when I took over the school district in D.C. in 2007, uh, part of the reason why the mayor was able to get mayoral control of the schools was because we had very uh, liberal charter school laws, in fact, very friendly laws. Um, and uh, so the number of charter schools was growing tremendously. Uh, and uh, kids were leaving the traditional public school system by the thousands, so much so that about 40% of the school-aged kids in D.C. right now attend charter schools. And so even the, the, the most staunch defenders of the status quo looked up and said, holy crap, if we don't do something soon, in 10 years there is going to be no D.C. public school system. So it, it, it sort of forced uh, uh, you know, even the most entrenched interests to say, okay, we've, we've got to change. Um, I think that this... That, that what really needs to, to turn if we're going to uh, tackle this choice issue is the mindset and the mentality that drives so many of us who, who are running the school districts every day. Um, and I was, I was telling Father Scully, he was, he was chiding me a little bit about my, my, um, my quote unquote education on, on vouchers. So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about this. Um, when I got to DC, there was a, a voucher program, about 2,000 kids in the city um, received uh, vouchers through the Opportunity Scholarships Program. And uh, the, the program was in jeopardy, and so people were sort of asking me to kind of weigh in. What do you think about this? Do you support it? Do you not support it? And I am a, I'm a Democrat, card-carrying Democrat, have been my whole life. And because of that, I, when I came into the district, I was against vouchers, because as a Democrat, you're supposed to be against vouchers, right? Uh, and so, um, I, I, you know, the, the problem was that when I got into this role, I was faced every day with these mothers who had done everything that we would want a mom to do. So we have a mom who lives in Anacostia. She researches her neighborhood school, finds out that 10% of the kids at that school are in grade level, uh, thinks, oh my gosh, my kid has a 90% of chance of failure. If, if I send them there, not good enough for my kid, right? Then she would take the next logical step, which we recommended to her, which was you apply through the out-of-boundary lottery process to one of the you know, dozen schools over on the other side of town uh, where the achievement levels are very high. Uh, but undoubtedly, uh, 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 the majority of those mothers would not, the, the kids would not win the lottery because there were too few spots at those schools and, and way too many applicants. So then I would have these mothers who would come to me and they'd say, so now what am I supposed to do? And I, I would be in these meetings thinking, oh my gosh, if I don't have a spot at a traditional DC public school that I would feel comfortable sending my own two children to, because I sent my kids to the DC public school. So if, if I don't have a spot at a school that I would send my own kids to, I'm thinking to myself, who am I to stop this mom from taking a $7,500 voucher, which by the way was $1,500 less than what we were spending per child so that they could go to, to potentially a Catholic school and get a great education. And that's where my whole mindset and mentality turned, because I could not look those families in the eye and say, you know what, just suck it up for five more years while I fix the system. You know, your kid may not learn how to read in that period of time, but <laughs> take one for the team while, 
well, I'm seeing what I can do on a systematic level, right? So I, when I came out in favor of the vouchers, people went ballistic. I mean, you know, the Democrats were saying, hey, you're going against the party. And, and people said to me, we don't understand what you're doing because you are the person who has the most to lose from the voucher system. You're going to lose enrollment. You're going to lose resources. And don't you need the money to fix the system? And I said to those people, you, you, here's your problem with your thinking. My job as the chancellor is not to preserve and protect and defend a system that has been doing a disservice to children. Okay, my job is to make sure that every child in the city is getting a great education. I am agnostic as to the delivery mechanism. If it's in a charter school, fantastic. If it's in a private school through a voucher, okay. If it's one of my schools, as long as they're getting a great education, that, it, that's all that matters to me. I'm not, I'm not counting my market share. I'm not trying to figure, I'm not trapping kids in failing schools simply so that I can have more money to try to fix the system. That hasn't worked before. And I think that's, that's the whole point is that the policies in this country that have been driven by how do, we, how, how do we do right by the system or the district have gotten us into the place that we are in now. And so what we need is a fundamental shift to, to develop policies where we're looking at individual kids and families and making the decisions that are right for them. Uh, you know, I, I, I actually prefer to use the term parent choice instead of school choice. Because what I really think it's about, it's about empowering parents to be able to choose. And what I find so interesting in this country, the level of hypocrisy about choice is astounding. Because you got people running around talking about, oh, um, I, I'm, I'm not in favor of, of giving people choices. I'm not in favor of government money going to uh, religious schools. And they're here at Notre Dame on a Pell Grant. <laughs> you know, so, uh, <laughs> slight issue. But really, the issue in America is not parent choice. It is who has it. Because if you got money in America and schools are not working for your kids, you're either going to move to communities where they do work, or you're going to put your kids in private schools, or you're going to get them silver. And you don't care how many uh, government reports come out, you're going to take care of your own children. And, 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 and you, all, you all didn't really hear what Michelle said because she understated a point. She put her kids in the D.C. public schools. You got teachers teaching in schools that they would never put their own children in, demanding that other people's children stay there so they can get paid to put their kids in private schools. And with all due respect to Barack Obama, you cannot send your kids to sit well friends and then tell poor parents in D.C., y'all got to stay in the system and fix it. If it was so great, how come you didn't put your kids in there? You can't be Arne Duncan and give a, 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 a lecturing people, but you live in Virginia so that you can find good schools for your kids. And I know people don't like me to say this, but I got to say it. It's hypocrisy. If we truly believe that the issue is our children, then I'm in the Malcolm X camp that says by any means necessary. Because here's the reality of it. Just, just <laughs> think about this, is that when, when, when you tell a, 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 a parent that you have to keep your kid in a school that is clearly failing them because to let you out would destroy the system, it is what Michelle said. We have now put the system ahead of the needs and interests of our kids. And I want you all to conceptually understand something. There is a difference between public education and the system that delivers public education. 
The DC public schools is not public education. It is a delivery system. And the last I heard, the delivery systems were not set up by God. They were actually set up by human beings. And since that is the case, you actually could change the delivery system. <laughs> and, and since... And so public education is a concept, right? This notion that the public should be educated. So if you have a school here that's run by the school board and another school down the street that's run by the, 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 a, a Catholic school down the street, and if the, if the school over here, and you're taking kids, they're all coming from the same community. If the school over here, for whatever reason, is not educating the kids, isn't it in the public's interest and to figure out a way to get the kids over to a school that is educating them? Because after all, the issue is we want children to be educated. And whatever it is we need to educate those children is what we should be doing. And, and, and I'm a strong supporter of, of, of public schools. I'm a strong supporter of vouchers, tax credits, uh, opportunity scholarships, homeschooling, virtual schools. I, I support anything that will give parents an option to try to educate their children. And what I hope you all will do, and, and, and I'm going to end, oh, I saw that red light. So I'm going to end this way. It's, this is the first time I've seen the light, but I'm taking my time I didn't take for the first time. Okay, so, <laughs> so, so Malcolm, I'm giving my time back, man. So, okay, so it's, so it's all good. So, uh, no, but I'm going to finish. I'll, I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> No, no. Finish. I had a senior moment. I forgot where I was going to say something. <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll, add one, I'll add one thing in here. So I, you know, I, um, I, because I, I put my kids in the public schools specifically for this reason, because I, I wanted it to be that every decision that I was making every day as the chancellor, I knew was going to impact my own two kids. And uh, it was fascinating because through my, my three years on the job, people all the time would used to come up to me and say, Michelle, you need to slow down. You, you're trying to do too much, too fast. You need to realize that change takes time, et cetera. And universally, the people who would say that to me, none of them had their kids in the public schools. So it wasn't the people who had their kids in the public schools that were saying, telling me to slow down and not do so much and not try to be as aggressive. And uh, so we had a very tumultuous uh, experience where uh, we had a budget cut and I had to do layoffs. And I decided to do the layoffs by quality instead of by seniority, which is what traditionally happens. And there was this huge firestorm in the city. There were, you know, 240 some odd teachers who were laid off. And so a lot of the politicians in the city were all after me. You've got to hire these people back. You know, you, you, you've laid them off and, and they, they, they've worked for the system a long time and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so finally I said to one of them, I said, look, I'll tell you what, you don't have your children in the DC public schools right now. They're, they're in a private school somewhere. If you bring one of your kids back to the DC public schools, I will bring one of those teachers back <laughs> as long as you agree to have your child taught by that teacher. <laughs> and if you bring two of your kids back, I'll bring two of the teachers back. If you can get your whole family to bring all their kids from private school, I will bring as many teachers that I rift back as long as you are bringing your kids and, and, and nieces and nephews to be taught by these children. That's the deal. Mm. Nobody took me up on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> the next question, uh, I'm going to start with John and turn to Sarah, which is about, uh, as Howard mentioned, a lot of the great educational options historically, especially in inner cities, have been faith-based schools, especially, mm -hmm. especially Catholic schools. Um, for as long, James uh, Coleman and Andrew Greeley wrote about the Catholic school advantage, demonstrating this ability of Catholic schools in particular to educate kids that other people had written off as uneducatable. And um, so I, I wonder what you thought about the, whether the Catholic school advantage still exists. And, and really, this is a critical moment for Catholic schools, especially in our urban areas. Thousands of them have closed, and hundreds more will close. Thousands more will close in the next decade. 
So um, what should we do about this? What role does, what do, role does faith-based schools continue to play? And, and what can we do to really continue to allow them to serve that critical role of building civil society? Well, um, so uh, for a moment I'll be a social scientist which is the elaborate demonstration of the obvious by methods that are obscure. <laughs> um, I, will now, I will now invoke the authority of the research which shows the following, that if you put children into an environment where they are loved and cared for, okay, and you teach them well, and give them, you know, uh, Detroit used to talk about you know, unibody construction, just meant it was all made together, so the kid is not, it's an emotional problem today and it's an educational problem. You treat the child holistically like unibody construction uh, education. All the data suggests that other things equal religious schools, in particular Catholic schools, you know, that whole Catholic school miracle literature, you know, may uh, have been a little chauvinistic or triumphalistic for the Catholics who were involved uh, to get behind it, but the fact is those data hold up. Uh, it shows that, you know, kids who are disadvantaged in all sorts of ways compared to otherwise comparable kids, kids who are fortunate enough to find their way to inner city schools that are run by religious organizations, in particular Catholic ones, do better. And the canard, uh, which I'm tired of hearing, oh, it's all creaming and so forth, no, it's not. Um, and there are example after example. The plural of anecdote is not data. <laughs> uh, and we got lots of anecdotes and lots of data uh, to suggest uh, that this is so. But let me give you the, quickly the other piece of it, which goes back to the previous question. And again, I'll, I'll be a, a hometown boy, back to my uh, beloved Philadelphia. Last year in June, the Pew Charitable Trusts uh, did a survey and released a survey of parents in Philadelphia with regard to schools. And they asked the parents a uh, you know, whole range of questions. And one of the questions they asked of the parents who had their children in Philadelphia's public schools was, uh, have you ever tr actively tried, that is actually tried, to take your child out of the public school and move the child into a non-public school. And 62%, 62% of the parents said, yes, I have actively tried to do that, but were unable to because I lack the funds, so forth and so on. Another data point there is Philadelphia has something called the Children's Scholarship Fund of Philadelphia. Uh, there are many Children's Scholarship Fund organizations, but pound for pound, the Philadelphia one's probably one of the largest in the country. Since that organization came into being, in 1998, 108,000, have been received by the Children's Scholarship Fund of Philadelphia for a scholarship that would provide only on average about $1,200 to $1,300 and where the parent would have to come up with 500. So for a partial scholarship, partial tuition, and having to come up with at least 500 bucks, 108,000 have said, I'll take it. But unfortunately, like in Waiting for Superman, it's a lottery. There's not enough private money uh, to fund it. What would have happened in terms of the latent demand for faith-based education? We'd, be re we'd have to reopen closed Catholic schools in Philadelphia and in other cities around the country if true parental choice could be exercised by whatever means. So Echoing a lot of what John said, um, those of you that had the privilege of attending a Catholic school know the difference it made in your life. And, and I know growing up on the border in Texas, had I not been born to parents who put their children's um, well-being first and sacrificed to go to a Catholic school, my, my brother and my sister and I would not have had the opportunity that we had. And, and I think the thing that intrigues me the most is the more dysfunction or the more disadvantage in a student. So perhaps you're maybe race ethnic, perhaps you're low income, perhaps English isn't your first language. The more you pile on in terms of multiple disadvantage, the better you do at a Catholic school. So the advantage is there from a Catholic school. And I, maybe because I retired from an engineering company, I always kind of look for the root cause. And, and John touched on it, but I want to get a little more scientific, which is going to be a little surprising for me. But I first got intrigued by some research that a woman named Carol Dweck and Lisa Black, she's at Stanford, Lisa Blackwell at Columbia, were doing on girls and boys, and girls and boys persisting. And they stumbled on the notion that, because girls mature faster, they're always told when they're really young, you're really good at this. And so girls end, end up having a belief that it's innate. You're either good at something or you're not. Boys, because they mature a little slower, 
get told, just stay focused, just keep trying. And so boys sometimes learn to just stay at it and they'll master it. Well, leave gender issues aside, students have innate beliefs about intelligence. There are st students who believe that it's malleable, that is incremental. There are students that believe that it's fixed, it's an entity that exists within you. Long story short, students that have this belief that intelligence is incremental end up setting goals for themselves, persisting, and dealing with academic challenges better or more strongly, and you get grades that improve. Students that have this notion of fixed give up, and their grades start going down, and they don't persist in education. If that's how students feel, imagine what the teacher's behaviors then do. I think the best news about Catholic education is, in addition to the holistic view of the student, in addition to the love that the student feels, I think what gives us the ability to have the results we've had in Catholic schools is every person associated with a Catholic school believes that intelligence is malleable. And I'm not going to give up on that student before they give up on themselves. And I'm not going to let them give up on themselves because I believe in them. And we have to somehow find a way to make sure that we have more people believing that intelligence is malleable. And, and that is a, a core competency in Catholic schools that doesn't exist everywhere. And imagine if we were to have that belief in, in all of our schools. So my, my root cause analysis would say, we've got something in the teaching that in essence encourages something that needs to happen more widespread. To be perfectly frank though, my nervousness, and I've said this a couple of times today, I don't know that the Catholic Church understands what a jewel it has. I don't know that we have enough pastors, bishops, I don't know that we have enough in the hierarchy that understands that this isn't a service we're doing in the communities where we, where we practice. This is something that we have an obligation to deliver for more and more children. And so my hope would be that not only do we solve the parental choice, thank you, Howard, for that, that, that is just, you know, I, for so many working parents who don't have the ability to question or to push back and understand the value of the school, they're paying for that education. And they're paying for an education and they would never tolerate having to buy substandard products with their hard-earned money. Why should they be taxed to support an education system that isn't good enough for their kids? My hope is that we solve it for, for, within families, but I hope also that we solve it within the hierarchy of the Catholic Church so we understand the obligation we have to bring more of these Catholic education opportunities to, to America's disadvantaged. Thank you. Um, I, we were running a little behind, and it's not just because we have multiple professors on the panel. Um, but I do want to hope, I hope we have time for a few questions from the audience, but we have one final um, question for each of you, and we ask that you keep your answers to about 30 seconds, which is that um, uh, each of you, uh, so 170 years ago, Father Edward Soren, when he founded Notre Dame, he, he expressed his deep conviction that it would be um, a powerful means for good in this country. And at the time, it sounded a little far-fetched up in the deep woods of northern Indiana. Um, but we hope that this issue is, really gives us an opportunity to fulfill that aspiration. And so as we begin this year of discussion at Notre Dame about K-12 education, we ask for one piece of advice from each of you about what Notre Dame can do in this field to, to fulfill that aspiration of being a force for good in the country. So one of the biggest problems that I think we face right now in this school reform uh, effort is that people are very conflict averse. We all want to get along. Uh, the problem is that we are, we, we, we are willing to turn a blind eye to the absolute injustices that are happening to kids in schools in the name of harmony amongst adults, right? I get told, told, told this all the time, Michelle, you just gotta get along with everybody a little bit more, right? Be a little softer. Uh, and <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I think that what we need is a little less getting along and, and people who are willing to take the struggle on. I, it, 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 Kevin and I, my fiance and I talk about all this a lot, how we, it drives us nuts when people say, you know, this is the civil rights movement of our generation. This is not the civil rights movement, because in the civil rights movement, people didn't come into a room together and say, how can we collaborate and cooperate towards us? So this, this was a fight, it was a struggle. 
Uh, so of all of the places that I could go, you know, you, you, you all are so sort of known as the fighting Irish. <laughs> so I figure maybe we can inspire this. I would like one of you in this room to, to take this on such that, you know, later on you're saying, oh, Michelle Ree, she's, she's, she, she's, she's a wuss. She's, she's gone, <laughs> she's soft. Let me tell you what real school reform looks like, right? I mean, th we, we need, we need, we need, we need uh, people who are going to come along and take a harder and harder stand and be willing to absolutely take this issue on and be willing to risk everything along the way. That's the only way that we're going to change this circumstance. Uh, and in my mind, there is absolutely nothing that is more worth fighting for than to, 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 to ensure that the next generation of Americans all have, every single child in this country, regardless of their skin color and the zip code that they live in, et cetera, can have a chance at a great life and to live the American dream because they're getting an excellent education. Good okay, 30 seconds. I'm going to try to do my quickest twist of routine. Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, uh, what, what I hope you all would do is um, fight to establish the distinction between purpose and the method to get to purpose. Because if you get committed to a thing, like charter schools, for example, as opposed to the reason for charter schools. So what I hope you'll do over the next year is to struggle mightily to make sure you define purpose first and develop a commitment to purpose, not to the methodology to get to purpose. Because when you get committed to the methodology to get to purpose, you will become a protector of the status quo. So I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge what Notre Dame is already doing through the Institute for Educational Initiatives and the Alliance for Catholic Education. And forgive me if I get a little emotional, but when it started with the dream of teachers in Catholic schools, I was excited. When the teachers came back and said, my school's having some problems and the principal's academy was created, I was thinking, could it get any more holistic than this? And then ACE Consulting was born, and now the ACE Academies. And now we have the Catholic School Advantage. And I just, it, Notre Dame needs to be acknowledged for the fact that you are doing something that is so comprehensive, national in scope, and ahead of the game. So I just, I just to those of you that have supported IEI, and those of you that have supported the Alliance for Catholic Education, and those of you students who have given of yourselves, particularly those of you that thought you were gonna like dip into ACE, get your master's degree, and move on and stay. <laughs> let me just say, thank you for what you've done already, because you deserve a, a, a lot of kudos for that. But I want Notre Dame to be a game changer beyond this. I wonder if Notre Dame would entertain the notion of changing the way we evaluate promise and potential in students. And I wonder if Notre Dame would accept the challenge to create hope in millions of disadvantaged seventh graders. You know how selective colleges work. You, you work with the college board. You give them a list of criteria around the PSAT score. A whistle is blown in the spring of the, of the junior year and all the selective colleges go after the, the talented as defined by PSAT and other criteria students. If you think that maybe I want to get ahead of the game with my competition, like Duke Talented Identific Talent Identification Program, Johns Hopkins' the Center for Talented Youth, Vanderbilt's Programs for Talented Youth, you start maybe looking at kids who do well on standardized tests and rise above the norm. You give them the chance to take the ACT or the SAT, and if they score 500, they get to come to your program. I want to go back to this notion of students' belief in, in intellect and students who believe that, that it's malleable and they can get more intelligent if they just have the opportunity to learn more. Would Notre Dame be willing to change the paradigm by which we identify gifted and talented in this country and break the bonds of the PSAT, SAT, and ACT and say someone needs to come up with a measure that says which seventh graders out there have this ability have this belief in themselves 
that their intelligence is malleable, set our goal-oriented, overcome academic challenges, and will rise to the occasion no matter what we put. At a minimum, imagine the power of the research that Notre Dame could put out there and say, this is the better way to identify promise and potential, and it isn't whether the SAT, SAT, ACT, or other IQ test capture what they're getting through, through standardized testing. Wouldn't it be wonderful if Notre Dame, through an online intervention, could then take those kids and create an incremental intervention that helps these students score better on achievement test? Wouldn't it be interesting if Notre Dame was the first selective college that would say, irrespective of the PSAT scores, irrespective of the SAT scores, we believe these are the gifted and talented people, students in the United States, and these are the people that deserve a college education. That, to me, is what Notre Dame should take up. Um, when I was uh, the inaugural so-called faith star, I got to go around the country, saw hundreds of religious faith-based programs in all areas of social service, social welfare. Last quarter century, uh, I've done research and been involved in various nonprofits, community-serving nonprofits. A couple years ago, I came here, I met Father Scully, and I looked at the Alliance for Catholic Education. Now, I'm at the University of Pennsylvania, which, so far as I know, is not a religious school, <laughs> uh, although we call it St. Ben's, as in Ben Franklin. Um, I went back to, after seeing what was going on at this school, that institute, and with ACE, I went back to Penn and got my Penn guys and said, we gotta raise a million dollars so that St. Joe's University can replicate what you're doing here. And we did. Now, let me tell you something. I haven't done anything like that in my entire career. That is, you know, get inspired that way by something and then go and actually, you know, do something about it, feeling like that, God forbid, that I not be some part of this. Well, you are part of it. And I believe that if you take this charge seriously, I, and I'm not just, this is not Pollyannish, this is, I really do believe that this university, the Lord works in mysterious ways. Why, why did he come to South Bend? Uh, <laughs> 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 I don't know, New York would have been, I don't know. Uh, LA, I, but he did. And you have an opportunity, because the Calvary's not coming, folks. You have the intellectual, the civic, the social, and the spiritual capital and firepower to make a transformational difference in the lives of truly disadvantaged children, to transform, to figure out and help the rest of us have the courage and the heart how to transform the educational life prospects, and how to fix what's broken with our politics and everything that surrounds it. I really, I really do believe that. It, it wouldn't be a real academic event if we weren't over time. Of course. Um, but we're blessedly not that much over time. So uh, we are going to try to take just a couple questions from the audience, and then we're going to have to wrap up. I know, I hope this is a conversation. I know that it's something I'm going to be thinking about for weeks and months and years to come. So if there, there are two mics, and if there are just a couple questions, and, and they have to be as short as the 30-second answers, or even shorter. Hi, my name is Shannon. I'm a senior. Um, I have a question about the organization of public schooling. Um, we recognize that public schools are inherently in and among our local communities, but we also know that our communities are racially and class segregated and um, that funding in part comes from a property tax dollars. How do you change the system to combat larger systemic social, socioeconomic inequalities in a system that is founded and organized around it? And if you think that parental choice is part of that answer, how do you ensure quality of and access to charter and private schools. <laughs> <laughs> the dollars go with the student. The dollars go with the student. Right now, the, the dollars go to the schools based on headcount. The dollars go with the student. The dollars follow, follow the students. Public education is publicly financed, not necessarily publicly administered. Uh, I'm going to be an ACE teacher next year. A lot of my friends in the audience are going to be um, <laughs> teachers, uh, like with other organizations. What advice would you give for pe uh, young teachers like me who are going to be starting teaching for the first time next year? 
So I would say you got to stick it out through your first year. It's going to be the worst year of your life. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, I mean, I, I was not joking. I was very serious when I said before that teaching, you know, in an inner city school is, is the most difficult job you will ever have. Um, but it's also, if you do it well, the most rewarding job that you ever have. And uh, and you we will go through so much that first year, um, and, and you've got you've to stick it out. You have to continue to have high expectations of your kids. It will, it will be easy to fall into a place where you begin to say, well, maybe if, it's, you know, if their parents would come in more, and then this, and then that, and then all these excuses, because you will probably for the first time in your life, as, as it was for mine, you know, the first time that I really was bad at something, and um, and you've got to muscle your way through that, and 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 realize um, always that there is something that you could be doing better. That it's not the kids; it's 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 actually you. And I I, I learned this because um, <laughs> I'll just give you my really quick one first year teacher um, talk. So I, I had this kid who was just drove me nuts every single day and I believed that she was the one who was sparking the you know misbehavior of all the other kids so I sent her to another teacher's room one day and I went to go pick her up and I saw her sitting there with her hands folded raising her hand participating <laughs> in this other teacher's classroom and then I realized oh my gosh it, it's not it's not her it's me <laughs> um, so just remember that <laughs> we have one time for one more question Okay, Nicole Williams, uh, elementary through high school Catholic, um, but 14 years as a public educator. Um, we've talked briefly about the disproportionate rate of African, Amer African American males, male, minority males, and I can't help but wonder to help ask, ask, answer that gentleman the conversation about cultural competency. It is not the conversation, but it is a conversation we need to have. Um, your, because the reality is like maybe 92% of our teachers are white, white females. And I can't help but think that that is something that we need to talk about. Um, hit it. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll do it. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, the way I look at this, and, and, I, and I hope I get at your question, the first thing I think is that people have to be who they are. And so if you go into a classroom and you're, like, you're not cool and you go in there fronting, everybody's going to know you fronting because you ain't, you ain't cool. So why are you trying to, you know, why are you trying to act cool? So if you go into a classroom, you white. The first day, you'll probably be white for the rest of the school year, right, if you're white. So the issue isn't like, I'm not white. The issue is, I'm white. I may not understand everything about what it is that's happening, but I am willing to learn. Exactly. Because I think, I think the issue is that, that kids, like everybody else, want to be respected. And I think the way that you respect people is you, you accept where you're at, and you try to figure out what is going to be, what, like I said, what lessons do I have to learn to better reach these kids? Because as you know, you, you, you got some black people and some, some, some Latinos who are bougie. And so they got a class problem. You understand what I'm saying? So they can't relate to the kids either because they, they, they got these class hangups. And, and, and probably the worst thing for a black or Latino kid is some bougie Negro or bougie Latino person who's like dealing with them from a, a, a perspective that they, they can't even relate. Because the kids would expect, hey, you look like me, you ought to be able to relate to me and find out these people can't relate to you at all because they're coming from some other place. And so what I would argue, cultural competence is to me a part of a larger framework of human interaction. And, and that that human interaction has to begin with my willingness to, to try to find out where you're at, wh wh what your assets are, what are the assets in your community, and, and I'm going to try to learn as much as I can. But at the same time, I'm not going to let my race, you know, I'm not going to let you run over me because I'm white. 
Yeah, I'm white, but I ain't no, uh, I got to use the right word up in here, but I'm not, <laughs> you know, like, I'm, not, I'm not like who you think I am. You understand know what I'm saying? And, and, and so we, we, we're going we're gonna to deal, you know, like a Chris, show you how bad I am. My social psychologist is Chris Rock. That's the level that I'm operating at. Right. And so, so, so one of the things that Chris Rock says is you got to keep it real. And, 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 and I believe that that's where you got to start, that you got to keep it real. And, 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 and because what we need right now are great teachers, no matter what their race is. But they've got to be people who can relate to the kids, learn from the kids, and teach the kids. Amen. Would be the so I would approach it. I just want to add one thing, and this is not at all sexy like what Howard just said. <laughs> <laughs> but, but frankly, we haven't thought through. There's education reform needed in the colleges of education and post-secondary education. And, and, and a very simple thing is we know that if students don't get hooked on either math or science between the third or fifth grade, they're likely not to persist in, in, in higher education. Why don't we have more students of color pursuing science and math elementary teaching opportunities. Well, the way that field works, you have to do your four years, so you have to earn your bachelor's degree in math or science, and then you've got to go to the College of Education and get certified. What low-income kid is going to want to do six years of college instead of four or five years of college? So rethinking the way the Colleges of Education interact with the Colleges of Natural Science should have been a no-brainer 20 years ago, and yet it wasn't. It's only until recently that we've had the, the, the breakthroughs around re-engineering, getting your master's in education, and getting the way. ACE is a perfect example of rethinking how do we take talented people who may have that cultural competency, who may have that desire to serve, and getting that master's in education so they're certified to teach. We also, not, in addition to Howard's exciting story about cultural competency, we need to rethink the way post-secondary education is creating teachers and make it more vital and get them out doing field work sooner so that they're not afraid that first year. Could I, could I just add one other thing? And this is something <laughs> that Malcolm and I talked about, but I, I want you all to start thinking deeply about w the, the ways that we're currently teaching kids doesn't work for large numbers of kids. And, and so begin to look at this idea, for example, of blended learning. And, 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 and the whole concept of, of modulizing instruction and beginning to try to figure out ways to, to uh, individualize instruction. B because, uh, you know, the distinction between digital immigrants and digital natives. And most of you all are like digital uh, uh, natives. You know, people my age group are like digital immigrants. I mean, we're the, we're the kind of people that call people on the phone to ask, did you get my email? You know, sort of. <laughs> You know what I mean? You're like, well, yes, you know what I mean? So, but, 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 just, but, but just think how more deeply digital the, the younger kids behind you all are going to be. And, and it's, it's, it, it has an impact not only on how they, they facilitate learning, but it also has an impact on their brains. And, 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 and so if we keep trying to teach these kids using old industrial age models, and don't understand the, the, the whole disrupting technology and the impact that's, that that's going to have, whether we're culturally competent or not, we're, we're going to miss large numbers of these kids. And so I, I, I think we've got to think very differently about teaching and learning, and, you know, in addition to clearly what you raised. Unfortunately, we are going to have to cut off the questions from the audience, but um, I really couldn't close this program without inviting my dear friend and colleague, Father Tim Scully, um, up onto the stage to join us. As many of you know, Father Tim, along with Father Sean McGraw, founded the Alliance for Catholic Education about uh, 20 years ago. He's currently director of the Institute for Education Initiatives and in his spare time, a, a scholar of Latin American politics. Um, but most importantly, he is uh, the animating force behind all that we do here at Notre Dame. And he has converted hundreds with his enthusiasm um, for this cause. Thank and you. And I know he needs to be here and conclude. Very briefly, I want to thank uh, the members of, the, of this panel and everyone who's here tonight. Uh, you've taken time out of a beautiful spring evening. You could have been anywhere else. You were here. Thank you. It uh, shows that you care about our children. 
I want to tell the panelists that I am going to give a $500 gift certificate, as I mentioned, to anyone who mentioned ACE. In your <laughs> so thank you. And uh, voice out a thousand. <laughs> And John, I might mention to you in a special way that actually the Lord didn't stop here. His mother did. <laughs> <laughs> and she was his best and first teacher. Don't remember that. I just don't want you to get struck by lightning when you walk out of here. <laughs> you know, um, if, um, if you think about it, the reason we need to talk about this is that this country is founded on a very simple but profound revolutionary idea. We were really the first nation in the world to adopt this idea that every human being ought to have an equal chance, an equal opportunity is the word we use. It's not an equal outcome. Some choose to use that. It's an equal opportunity. And that creed is vitiated by the way we fund schools and by the way we teach our children and the access that their parents have for their children. It's not a racial issue. It's not even a class issue. It's not even a gender issue. It, it really is an issue that eats away at our identity. We can't live with ourselves this way. We just cannot live with ourselves this way. So we're going to spend the next year and beyond talking about this. and. I want to invite those six people who were standing here with questions. My colleagues are going to be mad at me, but we are having a small reception, I apologize, afterwards. You six ought to come to that reception and get a chance to ask your questions. <laughs> God bless you for being here tonight, and, and God bless our conversation this, uh, this uh, term. And in a special way, God bless the vocations of the four people who blessed us with their presence tonight. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thanks, Sarah.